morning to open the Word of God. That's why we gather. We don't gather for any other reason but to open the Scripture, to fellowship with one another, certainly, but to really, during this time, to open the Word of God because that's who we need to hear from is God. And we've been going verse by verse through the book of 1 Corinthians. Our study has brought us to chapter 3. And uh, I invite you to turn there to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. It was read earlier for you. As I told you last time, this passage brings us face to face with some future realities. And what I mean by that specifically is the subject of rewards for the, work, for the works done by believers. The rewards in the future. One day Christ will come again. He will gather believers and he will give rewards to believers. That is what is taught in this passage and also in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You will notice in verse 13 through 15, each man's work will become evident for the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire and fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. You see that in verse 13. Then in verse 14, if any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet, at, yet so as through fire. So there's coming a time when the works of all believers will be subject to, to a test by fire to determine whether those works are worthy of reward. I combine that with 2 Corinthians chapter 5 in saying that statement. Because I believe, as I told you last time, that primarily in this chapter, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we're talking about rewards for the teachers, rewards for those who are leading the church at Corinth. I believe that is specifically what is in mind as the Apostle Paul is speaking. Though it is true that all believers will receive rewards, this passage, if I took it in isolation, I might say, well, this teaches the same thing. All believers will receive rewards. That would be a true statement. But I believe this passage specifically is talking about the teachers who are in Corinth. I tried to show you that last time. Uh, Paul says in verses 1 through 4, you're immature. That is the reason for the divisions among you. You're jealous. You're angry at each other. You have factions in your church. You're, you're elevating men. You're making much of Paul, much of Apollos, much of Cephas. You're making much of your leaders like the philosophers do, make much of their leaders and their teachers. You are focusing too much on men. He goes into verses 5 through 8, and he tells them it's not man who causes growth. Man is just an instrument. Man is just a water boy. Man is just a bus boy. Man is just a servant used by God to do work, a work in your life. I planted, Apollos watered, God caused the growth. That's the emphasis of verses 5 through 8. But the focus there is on the leaders. And then that just flows into this chapter, this section of the chapter. Notice in verse 9, well, verse 9, for we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. And then Paul now goes into speaking about this building, this church. That's a metaphor for church. Talks about the building of the church, the building of the building. He talks about his role in doing that. He talks about the role of those teachers that came after him in doing that. He talks about the different building materials that they can use in doing that. He talks about the judgment of their works in doing that. He gives a very stern warning in verses 16 and 17 for those who would try to destroy the church. All of that was read to you earlier. But that gives you an idea of this section. This section is sandwiched between 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10 all the way through what I just read to you and uh, recited for you in 1 Corinthians 3, 8. Then you have this section 9 through 17. And then notice what you have down in verse 21. So then, 
no one boast in men for all things belong to you, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world of life or death or things present or things to come. And you belong to Christ. Christ belongs to God. Let no man, chapter 4, verse 1, regard us in this manner as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. In this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy. He has not left the issue of divisions in the church because people are exalting their leaders and elevating their leaders. That's my point. The reason I don't think this is talking about the rewards for all believers particularly is because it's sandwiched between verses that talk about divisions in the church specifically because people exalt leaders and specifically because of what the leaders are teaching. If I, when I take you to 2 Corinthians 5, either this week or next, I will show you more specifically how it relates to all believers. Though I do think anybody that teaches in the church needs to pay heed to what is being said in this section. Because God has given you certain materials to build on the building, to build on the foundation that has been laid in Christ. Notice with me these verses, very important verses. Verse 10, according to the grace of God, which was given to... Let me, let me take you back if I can. Just go back up to verse um, 9, excuse me, verse 8 in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward. He introduces this whole subject of rewards in that verse, because that's what these verses are about. You've got the planter, you've got the waterers. They're going to receive their own reward. They're one, but they're going to receive their own reward. And so now Paul talking about his role, his role and what he did and his work in the Corinthian church in, in verse in verse 10 of chapter 3, he says, According to the grace of God which was given to me like a, a wise master builder, I laid a foundation. I laid the foundation. I came to town. I shared the gospel. Five years ago I did this. I came into the, uh, into the marketplace and preached. And many of you believed. And a church was formed. I laid the foundation. I did the pioneering work. In Corinth, I was the general contractor. I had the blueprint. That's the language used there in verse 10. It's all by the grace of God. It's not because of anything special about me. I am what I am by the grace of God. If I did not have God's grace, I would simply be a persecutor and blasphemer. But because of God's grace, I am what I am. He is the one that used me to establish this church. And then he makes a point. He moves to those who are going to come after him, and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. I laid a foundation. Christ is that foundation. The gospel is that foundation. And those who come after me must be careful how they build on this foundation. I don't believe he's talking about Apollos there at this point. He's already said things about Apollos. I think he's talking about the current teachers in Corinth. The current teachers in Corinth that would be somewhat responsible, maybe directly responsible for all this division, for encouraging the things that would promote this division in people. I believe that's who he's referring to in this section. Um, they must be careful how they build on it. And the problems in the Corinthian church are, are a reference to these, I mean, this is a reference to the current leaders, and that is who he is addressing, warning them of consequences, specifically loss of reward. 
Verse 11, for no man can lay a foundation other than that which is, is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Paul says, I preach nothing but Christ and him crucified. That's the foundation. If you're going to build on this foundation, Christ being the cornerstone, you better make sure that everything you build with aligns with Christ. Folks, a church that does not have Christ as a foundation is not a church. They may be involved in social issues. Their foundation may be traditions. Their foundation may be ethics or morals. But if it's not Christ, it's not a church, no matter what the sign says outside. Christ is the cornerstone, and if the building's going to be built right, then everything that's built on top of that foundation must align with Christ. It must promote the gospel, not hinder the gospel. It must, it must be part of, encourage the proclamation of the gospel. It must edify and build up the church based on the gospel truths. And like I said last time, some churches have wrong foundations. If you're, if you're listening to us this morning and you not, get out your church's doctrinal statement, you don't attend this church, get out your church's doctrinal statement and find out what they're about and make sure what they're about is what they're preaching in the pulpit because it doesn't take long to figure out what the foundation is, what the truth is, what's being, by what's being said. And so any church that belongs to God is one that's built on and founded on the truth about Christ. And so now, now he moves into, see, he's concerned about the materials that are being used to build on the foundation. And that is the reason when we come to the next verse, of those, those who come after me, these, all these current teachers, if any man builds, see this in verse 12, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw, six building materials, six legitimate building materials, by the way, they built buildings out of those materials in this culture, for sure. Paul's not talking about Paul anymore and the foundation he laid. Now he's talking about those who come and build on this foundation, and he mentions these, notice they're listed, and this is a common way to list things in diminishing value. You have your more valuable gold, silver, precious stones, your least valuable wood, hay, and straw that follow that. Less expensive. And, and you see how this fits the context? These teachers, I believe what we're saying here is what are they teaching what are they teaching? What is the theology? What is the theology that allows people to act the way they do in Corinth? What is the theology that's being preached and taught that makes that okay to exalt men and not Christ? And so he says, you need to be using materials that are compatible with the gospel that is the emphasis of this whole section. You must have teaching that is compatible with the foundation. That's the argument. The New Testament doctrines must be taught. Doctrines that help us understand Christ better. The wood, hay, and straw, I believe, is directly pointing to things that will burn up one day, have no eternal value. Worldly wisdom that's the context, worldly wisdom, worldly thinking, philosophies of this age. He's saying, I believe in this context, that's what he's referring to, is people who promote and teach those kinds of things in the church. And, and, and give them equal authority to the Bible, equal authority to what God has said versus when it's not true. When Paul says the wisdom of this world is foolishness, foolishness. Even the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of this world. They wanted to mix it. I told you that earlier in the chapter in, in our study. They wanted to mix it together. 
They wanted human teaching involved in it. And Paul's basically pointing out that is a house that's built with straw. That's a house that's built with wood. That's built with flammable materials that will burn up when Christ comes and returns. And so Paul said, I came teaching the purity of the gospel. I never talked about all this foolishness. Five years later, you're mixing it together. You're teaching things that are worthless. You're teaching speculation. 2 Corinthians 5.10. I don't have time to go through that. I I went through this back in chapter 1. But those strongholds, folks, those strongholds, that is referring to the philosophies of our day. That is referring to speculations of our day. That is referring to things that are not in the Bible. Those are strongholds. And the only way to confront those strongholds is with truth, the truth of God's Word. You don't use fleshly means. That's the context of that. You don't use fleshly means. You don't use the weapons of our war. You don't use human means to attack those kinds of philosophies out there. We're surrounded by those kinds of philosophies today, just as they were surrounded by them. I've been reading Al Mohler's new book, the Gathering Storm, he takes that title from when um, Churchill, Churchill's book, when he saw what was happening with Nazis in Germany and all of that, and he uses the same thing called The Gathering Storm. And I'm not through the whole book yet, so I can't tell you everything about it, but the sections I have read so far, his point is that we are being bombarded with secularism, this is secular thinking, no God, no, no supernaturalism, nothing. Just exalting man and all of this. That's, that's our day. That's our culture. He says that many pastors and church members are being swept up in this, compromising on cultural issues. People who say they go to Bible-believing churches, people who say they believe the Bible, they're compromising on issues. You know what they're saying? He's saying they want to say, they're saying, I want to be on the right side of history. Or I want a place at the table to have the discussion. That's what a lot of these pastors are saying. I want a credibility. So I, I, I don't... The hard things of the Bible, I just sort of soften or I'm just willing to lay aside. Things like, things like moral issues, things like the definition of marriage, things like the definition of gender. Willing to compromise. Why? So I can at least get a place at the table because the world says, if you think like that, you can't even come to the table to talk with us. But I want to talk to them so bad, I will compromise so I can get to the table. That is the storm of secularism and compromising with it because you want a place at the table. Because you want, you want to be on the right side of history. You want to seem credible. That's the Corinthian problem, by the way. Same thing. This is what's going on in our culture. You can see it in many churches today. With pastors just giving in to that. On the authority of the Bible, well, some of it's from God, or pick and choose. The new thinking of our day is to say, I believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. I believe the Bible is authoritative. I believe that the Bible was written by God. I just don't do everything it says. That is the American Christian. And they're being swallowed up by secular thinking. So they can have a place at the table. They can look credible and sound credible in the eyes of the world. Forget what God thinks of me. What does man think of me? I fear man more than I fear God. That's what you're saying. There have been horrible sins in the church throughout history, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. And and a lot of them have been 
And one of the biggest has been racial issues. No doubt about that. No doubt about that. And there should be repentance for those things. Oh my goodness. I can't rewrite history. You can't rewrite history. But the answer is the same for then as it is today, is the gospel to repent. See, here's what many pastors are trying to do with this issue. They're trying to bring social justice issues and making them gospel issues. They're trying to make racial reconciliation issues. They're trying to make them gospel issues. Folks, my ability to treat others right is based on the fact that I am right with God. You understand? You cannot mix those together. If I'm going to treat others right, and if I'm going to love, my, love, love others and consider others more important than me, I need to be right with God first. That is not a racial reconciliation issue at all. But there are many who want to bring that in because at least that gets you to the table to talk. Folks, you are compromising the most important doctrine of our faith. It's faith alone in Christ alone. And yet, there are many who want to bring those things into the gospel. The only way I can love my brother, the only way I cannot show partiality, the only way I cannot be selfish is to be right with God. And until I'm at peace with God, I will be at peace with nobody else. And it saddens me. I went to Mendenhall, Mississippi several years ago. John Perkins was a black pastor who started a ministry there in the six, early 60s. I had everybody before we went on this mission trip read his biography, great biography of this black pastor. All that he went through, almost killed in, in the middle of Mississippi, as you can imagine, all through the 30s and 40s in his upbringing, and how horrible that time was in history of our, uh, of our nation. It was terrible reading that book, and it was sad reading that book, and my heart broke reading that book. This man wrote this book. He's a great, godly pastor. He started a ministry there in Mendenhall. We were taking a group of young people to that area, <laughs> to that area to to go and do some ministry there. So Matt Curtis was our intern at the time. He went with me and we went over there and met with the administrators of that ministry, a, a very kind and a black woman and her husband. We met with them and I offered to take them to dinner that night in Mendenhall, Mississippi. And this is in the early 2000s. And they accepted our invitation to go to dinner. This is after a day of her showing us around to all the things we'd be doing while we were there. We went to dinner that night, and I walked in, not thinking much about anything. We sat down, talking with each other and, and everything, and uh, this lady, I, I, I asked him, I said, it must have been really hard, growing, from the book and everything, just about the ministry, it must have been very hard growing up in this area. She goes, oh, you just, it's been terrible, it was terrible. And her husband said, you know, there are men in the KKK sitting in this restaurant right now, looking at us, sitting with two white guys. And his point was really well taken. He said, you know what? They'll go to church on Sunday, and then they'll, they'll hate on Monday. Friends, I have a problem with a church that has a theology like that. You, you see, that is a church that is just like the Corinthian church. They were swallowed up in their cultural thinking, and they carried that thinking into the church. Laws are not going to change anything. Tearing down our society is not going to do anything. None of those things change hearts. Only Christ can change hearts. Only the gospel can change hearts. I can't rewrite that history, but I can certainly acknowledge that it was wrong. It's a wrong view of Christianity. It's a wrong view of the Bible. It is not God's wisdom. It's just man's selfishness and pride. I mean, that's just one issue. We've got other issues in the church that we need to, to think about. And I mean, we've covered up abuse issues. I mean, that's not been good. That's been horrible. 
I'm not saying our church, but I'm just saying the church in general. And those are issues we need to just confront. Listen, I can't go back and change any history. That's ridiculous to talk like that. What I can say is, I can do what Haggai says. Consider your ways. Consider your ways. We always need to be asking ourselves, what are our ways like? Do they reflect the Scripture or do they not? How I live reflects what I believe. What is your theology that allows you to live, the way, live that way? Paul is speaking in Corinth. He's speaking to former slaves who were white. The issue's been around a long time. He's speaking to a culture, that, uh, to a church that has brought into their culture's thinking. It's like they too have been so influenced by that. I, I just say that because Moeller is right. The answer is not us to lock arms with Black Lives Matter. That is an ungodly organization. We have nothing in common with that organization whatsoever. I can agree with the sentence, as Mueller says it, I can agree with the sentence, Black Lives Matter, but I do not support an organization that is anti-God and anti-Christ. And I guarantee you there are churches this morning that that is in their sermon topic somewhere, promoting that. And I wonder if they've even read anything about them or they even care if it lines up with the Bible or not. See, this is what Paul is getting at. The Corinthians did the very same thing. Their teachers were accommodating the culture's thinking. And Paul says that's wood, hay, and straw. And it's just simply going to burn up one day when you stand before Christ. If you're a Christian pastor and you're doing that and you stand before Christ one day, you have to ask yourself, am I feeding my people that God has entrusted to me? Am I feeding them wood, hay, or straw, or silver, gold, and precious stones? What? I, I want to be a gold church. Not one that's all going to burn up one day. What, 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 look how this goes. Look how this passage goes. I don't even know if I, I have notes everywhere on this page, and I don't know if I said them all or not, but let's, just follow me on verse 13. Each man's work will become evident. Each man, I believe we're talking about these teachers, okay? Each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it because it, too, it, it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. It's a revealing fire. It's a, a fire that tests the quality of something. And I believe we're talking about his instruction, his doctrine, what, he's, what his contribution is to the foundation that Paul laid. There's coming a day like that at the second coming of Christ when you as a teacher, you will stand before Christ and give an account of what you have said and how you have contributed to the foundation. Look down in verse 5 of chapter 4. When the Lord comes, he will, second part of the verse, he will bring to light things hidden in darkness and disclose the motives of men's heart. Were you fearing God or were you fearing man? Do you just want a place at the table or you want a place in the kingdom? In verse 13, it says, the quality, test the quality of each man's work. Understand, this is not the great white throne judgment, okay? This is not the great white throne judgment where unbelievers are judged. That is not what this is. This is a time of reward. 2 Corinthians calls it the Bema Seat of Christ. I don't have time to go there this morning. I will get there next time. But the point is, that's a time when all believers will be standing before Christ to be rewarded for works. It is not a time of judgment. It is not a time, it is not a time when you will be held accountable for your sin. You know why you will not be held accountable for your sin? Because your sin has already been paid for in Christ. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You are already a citizen of heaven if you're a Christian. So we're not talking about that. 
here. Understand that. If you're not a believer, you won't even appear here. You'll be at the great white throne judgment. That's different in the book of Revelation. This is believers, specifically in this passage, teachers. He says, will your teaching hold up to inspection? Will it be the right teaching about Christ? Or will it be just your opinions? Will it just be your speculations? Will it just be so you will be popular? Will it be just so you can be one who tickles men's ears? If any man's work which he has built on remains, excuse me, if any man's work which he has built on it remains, he'll receive a reward. That's, that's gold, that's silver, that's precious stones. They don't burn up. They're inflammable. The others are flammable. It's like the guy wasted his whole life. He wasted a lot of time talking about those things. The things that are burned up. He just wasted his time. He might be a Christian, but he just wasted his time. He made no impact. He might have got a place at the table. If any man's work which he has built on remains, he'll receive a reward. Um, Crowns. Paul talks about crowns being given. I'm not exactly sure. Of, we're not given a whole lot of information on all of this, but it is talked a lot about in the Bible. I don't have time to take you to all the places it's talked about. I will do that next week because it's fascinating to see all the times Jesus talks about rewards. It really is. You get rewarded for being persecuted. You know that? You get rewarded for giving a cup of water to somebody. You get rewarded for suffering, there's reward. Jesus talks about this a lot of places. I'll take you there next time. But look at verse 15. If any man's work is burned up, some people think the Roman Catholic Church says this is purgatory. It's not purgatory. This is, this is not a purifying fire. That's what, they, that's what they mean by purgatory. Purifying you. Why? So you can get, get you ready for heaven. Get you so you can be justified before God. False teaching. That's a false teaching. We're justified by faith in Christ alone. There's no purgatory. They say this is, they like to say this is what it is. This is their, in fact, this is the main passage they use. Fire. But this is not that kind of fire. This is a, a fire that tests the quality of something Gold is tested by fire. So it's the quality of something. Some, you know, some people may get a large crowd and they may have gone through their whole life, but the question is, when it was tested by fire and the quality of that ministry, did it really, really help anybody grow in Christ? Did it really do anything for the kingdom of God? Did it do anything to promote the gospel? Did it do anything to build on the foundation and edify believers? So, it's a dangerous thing to be a teacher, folks. Notice three, you don't, I don't have to turn there. James 3, 1. Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. If you're going to stand up and talk God's word, there's a tremendous accountability there. Next week, I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you the hard warning that he gives. When you stand up and God calls it a holy temple, that's the church. He calls you and I gathered in this room this morning. He calls us a holy, the temple of God, the dwelling place of God, corporately. a stricter judgment for those who teach and they need to make sure it's the truth about Christ. And people that teach the Word of God know that's not easy. They know it's hard. They know know that that you miss a lot of football games. They know all of that. They know you're under satanic oppression at times. They they know that and they know that you're going to be misunderstood by people. You're criticized. You put yourself out there. 
They know that. But you know what motivates a teacher is to one day hear, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what motivates a teacher. Motivates a teacher to to see people grow and to proclaim the word of God and to see people mature in their faith. It motivates a teacher to be a pastor of a church like this and have people in front of me who have an appetite for everything I'm saying here. That motivates me. I'm thankful to God I don't have to come here every week and defend the Bible to you because that's not what we're about. We believe it. We believe it. It's the word of God, and we believe it's authoritative. My, I, my concern to you this morning is, are you applying it? That's my concern. That, that's, the, that's an issue right now in the church. Are we living it? Are we living it and doing what it says? Because you are accountable. I may stand up here and teach it, or Ben or Doug or Charlie may stand up here and teach it, but we're accountable, but you're accountable as well. You are accountable to what you hear and what is preached. And there's coming a day when, when that will be an issue for you, and I'll show you that in 2 Corinthians next week, uh, for you as you stand before Christ. And your works are tested for their quality as well. If you don't know Christ, our invitation to you this morning is put your faith in Jesus. Listen, if you're living this morning in fear and you're not a Christian, you should be in fear. You should be. Christ is the answer. Christ is the hope. You need to fear God and not man. And bow your knee to Christ. Recognize you are a sinner. Recognize that you have fallen short of God's glory because of your sin and that you can't do anything to change your sinful condition. And because of your sinful condition, you are destined for hell. And the only remedy is Christ. He came into the world to rescue sinners from condemnation and from hell. And it's by faith in Christ, faith in the fact that he took the punishment you deserve and I deserve, he took that in our place. He comes into our lives and changes us and works in us. He floods our hearts with love that we might love even our enemies, that we might love one another, something none of us can do in our own strength. Friends, I invite you to put your faith and trust in Jesus. God, thank you for our time this morning. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for truth. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that we can come before you and And I pray for those listening this morning. If someone's sitting in their living room and they don't know Christ, I pray they would bow their heart in submission to Christ. Cry out to God for salvation. Admit they're a sinner. And cry out for his salvation in their lives. We praise you and thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen.